about three weeks ago, I received a phone call from a young girl. The young girl told me that she is from a high school that I had gone to mentor um, some time back. She told me, you know, I have watched your video titled Stop the Blame and about taking responsibility for my life. But I don't know how to do that. And she proceeded to say, I have something to tell you. She said, when I was 10 years old, I was raped, I was defiled by a neighbor, a grown man who was married with children. And this person infected me with a, an STD, sexually transmitted disease. As if that was not enough, a series of unfortunate events happened after that, that ensured the truth never came out. And so this girl has been silent for 10 years, suffering alone with an STD. She said, I know if I told my mom, if I told anybody, they would not believe me. So I just kept silent. And she said, I need your help. I don't know what to do. So it's been 10 years of suffering. It's been 10 years of having an STD because now she's 20 years old. Now I have connected this girl with the help that she needs. But I wish I could say that this is an isolated case. In my line of work as a youth mentor and, and, and a youth trainer, I have met many girls and boys that have gone through this experience. You know, they have been raped by a parent, they have been defiled by a parent, they have been defiled by um, a, a neighbor, a cousin, an uncle. This is happening in our families. There is something very wrong with a society where fathers are raping their children, where aunties, where mothers are defiling their children, where uncles cannot be trusted with their little nieces and nephews, where next door neighbors are coming in and are predators to the children in our homes. There's something wrong with a society like that. And the culture of silence, this stigma, this taboo around this subject of sexual violence really is what makes these perpetrators, these predators thrive. It's what makes them keep doing this because we are not talking about it. And so in my own small way, I want to talk about this. I want to shed some light on this topic of sexual violence. And so therefore I'm going to begin and, and do a series of conversations around this. I'm going to talk to a human rights lawyer who is going to shed some light on um, just the definitions around sexual violence. You know, what is rape, what is defilement, what is um, sexual harassment, what does the law say about it? Uh, what help is available for survivors of sexual violence. And then I'm going to talk to someone who has survived um, sexual violence. And they're just going to talk about how this affected them and their journey towards healing. And then after that, I'll talk about the myths surrounding this topic of sexual violence. And then what, what can we do to prevent this because prevention is always better than cure so what can we do as young people what can you do as parents what can we do as just a society to prevent this from happening this series is dedicated to this young girl that called me three weeks ago and it's also dedicated to every young girl and young boy 
that feels forgotten, that is suffering in silence. And so today we begin this conversation, and this is the first segment where we are talking to a human rights lawyer who is going to help us just understand the legal aspect around this subject, help us understand about the definitions um, around sexual violence and the help that is available for survivors of sexual violence. Is this an easy conversation to have? No. Is it a necessary conversation to have? Yes, it is a necessary conversation to have. So I pray that you'll join me and let's have this conversation. Hi and welcome to this very important conversation. I'm glad you're watching. This is the first segment of this conversation on sexual violence. And sexual violence is one of those conversations that there's so much mystery, so much stigma um, around it. And the reason why we don't get to hear much about it is because the victims are silent. The victims are not talking because, um, because of just that culture of silence. Um, there are boys and girls that are being defiled, that are being raped um, within our families, within our neighborhoods, in our communities, and nobody's talking about it. Whether it's in our families, whether it's in our churches, whether it's uh, in schools, colleges, whatever it is, we are really not talking about it. And so that's why I wanted us to start this conversation and to just um, kick us off. We have a very special guest with us today, and her name is Nelly Warega. Um, Nelly Warega is a human rights lawyer and legal researcher based in Nairobi. She specializes in the advancement of women and girls' rights, and in particular areas of sexual and gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Other areas of her expertise include international criminal justice and transitional justice. Thank you so much, Nelly, for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yes, um, and just to the viewer, I have known Nelly for many years, and she is a brilliant, delightful um, person um, that is just so knowledgeable. And I, would, I want you to stick around, um, and I know that you're going to learn something today. She's just going to help us um, kind of understand the definitions around this subject when it comes to the law of Kenya and to the victims, what, how, can, how can they find help when they find themselves in this situation? So welcome, Nelly. We're so glad to have you today. And I want you to tell us a bit about what you do and your work with sexual violence. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for you know allowing me to share the platform with you. This is such an honor. I like um, what you're doing. I like the space that you have created for young people to keep learning because learning is one of those things that never ends. However old you are, you keep learning new things. And uh, yeah. a lot of the things you talk about are also very dear to my heart. And so yeah. to have this platform to be able to share a bit of what I know with, with you and with everyone else who's watching, I, I am happy and I'm honored to be here. So um, as you've said, I am a human rights lawyer. I am an activist. M most, most people you know, like to refer to themselves as an activist. I am an activist. Um, I'm also a legal researcher. And um, I, like you've said, my specialty is in areas of sexual violence. And I try to draw the connection between sexual violence and the rights of women and girls, particularly who have experienced sexual violence in then accessing sexual and reproductive health rights. Um, so there's that. Uh, currently, I work for an organization called Women's Link Worldwide. Um, Women's Link is an international organization that uh, uses the power of the law to advance the rights of women and girls. So you use, and, and when I say using the power of the law, what I mean is we use litigation and other forms of legal action to then uh, push for reforms and push for implementation of the laws to ensure that the rights of women and girls as they are provided you know, at the international, regional and national levels are then adhered to. 
Um, I think it's important for me to mention that today I am here in my personal capacity and not as an employee of Women's Link. Although mm -hmm. the values, I mean, our values are the same. Um, I work for the organization because I believe in, 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 in their values and the work that they do. So with regards to what I do specifically on issues of, of, of sexual violence, um, I think at a personal level, what I can say is I do a lot of research on sexual violence because it's important to 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 document, right? Some, if we're mm -hmm. talking about knowledge, how are we going to share the knowledge that we have if we do not have um, information on the history or or the impact or um, what do you call it, the, the rampancy, all those mm -hmm. things. So I do a lot of research and try to write um, if it's, you know, getting published or just sharing my work with the people uh, that I interact with. Um, so there's that aspect of it. Um, I also volunteer uh, my time on a case which I started working on when I was working at my uh, previous organization, at the previous organization where I was at, which is a case that was filed by survivors of sexual violence during the post-election violence period in 2007. I'm, I'm sure many of mm. you know about this. Um, it's unfortunate that this matter is still pending, and I guess we can talk about it later as, as, as we have our conversation. But so mm -hmm. there's that of it, and then there's also the legal advice that I give to survivors. So if you mm. come to a survivor and, and, and you say, I mean, this has happened to me, where do I go? Who do I speak with? I may not mm. necessarily go to court, but I want assistance. What assistance is there for me? Uh, one, for someone who wants to go to court, and two, for someone who may not necessarily want to go to court, but still wants some kind of support. So mm. I, I think in a nutshell, um, there's a lot, there's a lot of it that happens, um, you know, uh, behind uh, all that. But I think in a nutshell, that, that sort of sums it up. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, um, today I would like us to talk about uh, sexual violence in the context of both boys and girls because it's happening to both genders. And so could you just define for us what does the term sexual violence entail? Okay. Yeah, so usually when we are talking, when I'm thinking sexual violence, even before I get into some of the... Um, um, the definitions that have been put out there, for instance, by the uh, World Health Organization. First thing that comes to mind when we are talking sexual violence is consent, right? And I mean, and really that, I think that is the basis of it. Any um, unwanted sexual act that is done by one person to another without the consent of that other person. And that is why we are saying unwanted. So there are different types mm. of, of sexual violence, but I want to read for you the definition of, uh, uh, of sexual violence as has been recorded by the World Health Organization. And I quote, it says, any sexual act or attempt to obtain sexual act against a person uh, using coercion. And they go further to then explain coercion can be in a physical way. So someone can pin you down or coercion can be in a psychological way where someone is either intimidating you or has threatened you and said, look, if you don't do this, then, you know, um, if you don't comply, then this is what's going to happen. Or it's just a situation where two people are together and one one who has more power over the other is able to use words, their words in a way that compels the other person, not necessarily to say yes, but for them to proceed and do this act without the other person willfully wanting to engage. So, I mean, it's it's a lot to unpack. I know when you, when, when, when you say it in broad terms like that, it sounds like, okay, so, you know, a different scenarios come to mind. But really, I always say the basis of it is consent, right? And we need to understand mm. what what, uh, what consent entails. And and I guess now those are the instances where you have situations where we are, we, we are saying, if you're a minor, and a minor here is someone who's 18 years and below, legally you cannot consent. So once you understand issues of consent and you understand that as a minor you cannot consent, then you realize that a lot of situations that are happening out here 
that people may not necessarily understand or know about really do fall in this category of sexual violence. So we have um, we have rape. I think this is uh, what most people use as a general term when they're talking about sexual violence. But you then realize that sometimes people use the word rape when really it is defilement. So I'll just try mm. to um, I'll define what rape is. And then I'll, I'll, I'll show the distinction as to what, what constitutes rape and what constitutes um, defilement. So before I get into it, I need to mention that this, all these offenses are um, defined in the Sexual Offenses Act of Kenya. And this is uh, a piece of legislation that is public document. If you want to have a look, you can go to the Kenya Law Reports website. And you can just, you know, as a search there on the search words, you can search for the Sexual Offences Act. It will pop out and you can download it and read it for yourself. I think it's important for all of us to be aware and to understand these things um, comprehensively. Um, the definition of rape, according to the Sexual Offences Act, is an, where one intentionally commits an act that causes penetration with his or her own genital organs. And just also keyword to um just to highlight that it says his or her so you know just to also say that you know women can also uh commit the the the, the offense of rape and mm -hmm. uh, where no consent or where it is obtained by force now that is rape so where the same happens but to a person who is below the 18 below the age of 18 years that is when we call it defilement. Now, the reason why it is important to separate, to call one rape and one defilement is because one carries a higher sentence. So defilement mm. carries a higher sentence because these are minors, right? Mm. Um, so if it is rape, then the sentence is not less than 10 years, but it can also go up to life imprisonment. Mm -hmm. So not less than 10 years. So we've mm -hmm. talked about rape, we've talked about um, defilement, and I also need to mention that defilement, the younger the minor, the mm -hmm. higher the sentence, right? So between the age of 16 to 18, if you defile someone between the age of 16 to 18, then the sentence is not less than 15 years. And mm -hmm. if you defile someone between the age of 12 to 15, then the mm -hmm. sentence is not less than 20 years. And between mm -hmm. the age of 0 to 11 years, then it is life imprisonment. So mm -hmm. uh, you can see the younger the person, the, 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 uh, you know, the tougher um, the sentence. And that is done intentionally. And so mm -hmm. the reason why it is important to understand the difference between rape and defilement is so that it is reported in the right way, right? So if you're mm. a parent, your child has been defiled, and you go to the station, and perhaps they're 17 years old, and you do not disclose that they're minors. Well, I mean, I would hope that a police officer would mm. be able to detect this, even you as a parent, if you're not able to point it out. But we've seen instances where, mm -hmm. you know, minors are defiled, but then they're recorded as, as, as rape. So that distinction is very important. Um, other types of uh, mm. sexual violence, we have sexual assault, which I will also just read for you mm -hmm. the definition of sexual assault, which it says unlawful penetration of genital organs with an object or where one manipulates another part of the body to penetrate a genital organ. As example, the hands. So that's sexual assault. Mm -hmm. And the sentence here is mm -hmm. not less than 10 years or up to life imprisonment. Um, so mm -hmm. again, rape, defilement, sexual assault. And uh, what mm -hmm. else can I talk about? I can mention sexual harassment. Um, and this is mm -hmm. where someone uses the position of authority um, to make advances on on someone of lesser authority, advances which are um, which are unwanted, and mm -hmm. usually sexual cases of sexual harassment are witnessed. Um, you know, one in places of work where you'll have your boss using his position as your boss to then make these advances on you, but because he is your boss 
Mm. You know, you're either afraid of losing your job or you're afraid that you may, you know, there would be consequences, you might be fired. Or we mm-hmm. also see in school where in schools where teachers or lecturers will then mm-hmm. use the students, right? And so we have several instances, we've had of several cases where lecturers um will make advances on students and the consequences of you know if you if you're not sort of complying with what his demands are is that you mm-hmm. will so yeah this, this is a situation where this someone is using their power or their authority to yeah. to you know to make advances on you knowing very well that you do not have the power to say no so mm-hmm. that is why we also see this by people who hold public uh, offices it's not just within schools or our places of work it's people mm-hmm. in government it's you know and the according to the sexual offenses act the mm-hmm. here is not less than 3 years mm-hmm. um, so it's also important to um note just before we move away from this question where i've talked about rape and defilement and uh uh sexual assault there can also be other strands of of it so for instance rape um where it is done by one person it is rape mm-hmm. where there's more than one person it is gang rape so if there mm-hmm. are two people, that is gang rape if there are three people that is gang rape if there are four or five whatever number it is it is gang rape mm-hmm. and even where you are two people and only one person is raping and the other one is watching out or you know you are you are assisting this person to commit this offense you are still convicted as someone who has um committed gang rape because you are aiding the crime right mm-hmm. um, and there are also instances where someone might not necessarily be charged by uh, charged with rape but it could be attempted rape so mm-hmm. you are before you actually went um you you went through with this with this unlawful act so um perhaps someone walked in or the victim was able to get away that attempted rape is also a crime because we have also seen instances where people don't report because it didn't get there so someone mm. pinned down and they made these advances and you were able to get away you know and then because it didn't go that far um mm-hmm. you know, not everyone understands that still that is an offense so it's also important to say attempted defilement and attempted rape those two are offenses that are recognized by the sexual offenses act and people mm-hmm. have heard of, of of those so i think i'll just stop there in case there are any um further questions yeah just to follow up on what you said about um lecturers and people's um in position of power uh intimidating you i have come across um in my work as a youth mentor um young people that uh, were made to uh enter into a sexual relationship with a lecturer um because they 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 feared for their for their grades um uh, or they received threats mm-hmm. but now the, the 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 thing is that how how do you prove that in court like how do you when you are going to report how do you prove that this lecturer was threatening me you know because at that time you're probably over 18 and it's very hard to prove um that i was just not it was not a a, a, cons- a consented relationship that this lecturer was actually threatening me i always say the first thing you can do is tell someone because when you tell mm. someone you You, you have a witness you have someone who can attest to it even if you're coming out 5 years later to say look this is really what was going on mm-hmm. um you not have reported it but i told a friend or i told the guidance and counselor at at my at at, at the facility that i work at or at the mm-hmm. institution uh, that i work at the school that i go to i mean it's i i say that the burden is not is not necessarily on you to prove also it is the burden is also on this person who has been accused to also prove their innocence right mm. and so in we've had instances where people have recorded conversations where you went in your lecturer called you and you knew very well 
why they were calling you and people have pressed the record button on their phones secretly and mm-hmm. those as evidence or we have instances where really some people have also had also noticed that something was going on and so someone is able to attest to it it becomes difficult where you know perhaps it went as far as someone touching you and it was just in the room just the two of you and so it's mm-hmm. really blood against theirs and this is really usually the challenge with sexual violence right it is mm-hmm. a crime all these are crimes that happen in private right i mean yeah. you don't walk outside and see someone being raped but yeah. yes if we look at the data there are so many people who are raped every day so mm-hmm. that's where you start with addressing the problem you first understand the nature in which the offense happened for you to say that you the victim the onus is on you as a victim to then prove that this happened to you it was just two of you right in certain instances uh, of rape i there are you there are instances where you're able to prove because sometimes samples were collected um mm. there were went to see a doctor sexual harassment becomes very very difficult just the mere fact that sometimes it you know it's just maybe words that were said or someone mm. touched you also so i see the difficulty in proving it but i always say if you are in that position and you're able mm-hmm. to get any form of evidence do mm-hmm. it in a manner that you are safe mm-hmm. don't go out of your way to try and collect this um evidence if it is going to harm you for instance mm-hmm. if you have a phone and, and, and you know that becomes a whole other situation so mm-hmm. if to be proven if there are instances where you know there are records perhaps someone so perhaps you told someone and that exists well and good where it doesn't exist i that doesn't mean you cannot report you still report because you never know your reporting mm-hmm. many other people will come out to say look she may not have evidence but this lecturer has done the same thing to me mm-hmm. and so okay. the evidence may be numbers in that case yeah okay okay so um on on 19th june 2020 as we commemorated the day of the african child a report was released of teen pregnancies during corona I, this is the infamous report right machakos yeah. county reported 4000 teen pregnancies the school going children had been impregnated since mid march these statistics uh, were picked from cases recording in all recorded in all county hospitals um of course the machakos county government refuted this figures but where there is smoke right there is fire now yeah. nelly people are looking at this report and really focusing on the social aspect of it you know how will these girls go back to school you know their their education is ruined but uh, many people are not focusing on the criminal part of this you know these children are under 18 most of these children in fact i was reading uh, some of the data that it the children as, are as young as 10 years old 10 years old pregnant um so somebody is having sex with these children mm-hmm. somebody is defiling these children um explain to us what this means yeah i mean those 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 figures were were shocking i mean and and we are we are talking about machakos here being 4000 but machakos was not even the highest i don't know if you saw nairobi nairobi had 11 mm-hmm. and these are cases mm-hmm. that were recorded in 3 months so march i think march to may when when did the report come out was it in may or beginning of june it was it was so in june 19th of june yes yeah and it's a very short uh, uh, period of time so and these are just the cases that have gone to the county uh these are people that have gone to the hospitals we know very well that teen pregnancies many of them don't go to 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 hospital you know so that's why we're saying that the numbers could be so much higher than is being presented they are definitely higher because these are really just the ones that were reported remember yeah. there are people who um perhaps in the village or wherever they are where they've gotten pregnant and they have not told anyone they're handling it at home as a family but mm. i mean what i would say about this first of all like you said uh when you see pregnant someone who's pregnant this is evidence of sexual activity right mm. and when you when when minors when you see someone who's below the age of 18 and and they're pregnant 
you start to ask yourself, you know, a number of questions. One, as a society, where have we gone wrong? Where, why is it that in, in, in three months or, or, or less, you can see such high numbers uh, recorded? I can't imagine what the total number of cases, you know, all over the country uh, are. And I know those figures are out there because the list that I saw really had just uh, the, the segregation per county. Um, and so you ask yourself as a society, what, what is it that has gone wrong? Are we addressing issues of, of, of sexual violence? Um, 4,000 uh, uh, girls pregnant could mean 4,000 perpetrators. It could mean some are repeat offenders. There are also instances where, you know, minors have engaged in, 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 in sexual activity. Those are there. We're yeah. not saying they are not there. But... Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are focusing on the criminal aspect of it. And it's yeah. really unfortunate the response that we saw, even from from the government. I mean, yeah. the immediate response was, one, to say these numbers are not real. Yeah. And two, to then shift the blame and say um, that children, you know, teenagers are at home and instead of either studying or doing what, they're engaging in sexual activity. I would ask myself, as a society, have you equipped the children with the knowledge that they need, mm -hmm. one, to understand sex and mm -hmm. to understand sexual violence, right? So mm -hmm. when I say sex, we are addressing instances where the two minors have engaged in sexual activity, right? And mm -hmm. when I say uh, issues of sexual violence, then we are not talking about the perpetrators here. Um, mm -hmm. Why? And the government response been, and I wish this is what happened. I wish the statement was more um, to encourage parents and say, if your child is pregnant, inquire more. What happened? Was it yeah. a parliament case? Um, mm. the, the data was collected for up to 19 years old, and so that would mean those are rape cases. Find out. As a society, that is how you, you address it. You try to find mm. out you encourage parents to talk to their children and you mm -hmm. tell encourage victims to then come out and report those cases because if if the 4000 cases have been recorded in hospitals and there are no matching numbers at the police station mm -hmm. yeah. they, they didn't go as far as reporting so find out what is the challenge here because these are definitely cases of, of assault i mean we are not going to talk about this other aspect where, you know, I have said that there are definitely uh, minors who are also engaging in, 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 in sex. That We are not tributing that, but we're saying sexual mm. violence has happened here. And, mm -hmm. those in, and those who have the power to address this are completely ignoring it and, you know, pushing it under the rug and saying parents mm -hmm. need the responsibility to ensure that your children are... Are, are safe or are at home and and yet you have not equipped your child even with the information to one detect sexual violence do, mm -hmm. they, understand, do they understand that if someone does something to me and i don't want it that that is wrong that that is a crime and that i can mm -hmm. and report and this person can actually be held accountable to 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 their actions so mm -hmm. i mean i think it's it's a problem and it to me, I feel like this is another crisis because yeah. I can't imagine what the numbers are going to be like in December. I mean, school is going to be out the whole of this year. We are in July. So by wow. December, what are these numbers going to look at? So are we sitting, are we just sitting as a society to wait for the numbers in Nairobi to double and be 22,000? Or, mm. you know, who yeah. is... Talking to this to these um, young girls, no one. Yeah.